Hey everyone, welcome to the Ceres Podcast. I'm your host, Stelios. In this episode, I'm joined by my good friend, Demetra Lawton from Ruddington Fish Bar. We chat about his career in fish and chips, his time working at McDonald's in Cyprus, and how he's focused now on building systems and procedures within his own business to create consistency. Today's episode is brought to you by Ceres Natural Gold Batter Mix. Our natural gold batter mix is the secret ingredient to achieving the best flavour and texture for your fish and chips, made with two premium British flowers, two unique raisin agents and a natural colouring. It delivers signature finish every time. It's perfect for takeaways, restaurants, click and collect, delivery operations, you name it. The natural gold batter mix adapts effortlessly for any food establishment, delivering consistent and astounding results. We prioritise high quality ingredients with no artificial flavours, no artificial colourings or preservatives. It's an all natural and as wholesome as it gets. Here's a five star verified review from Helen. This is the most consistent batter I've ever used and I've been in the business for some time. To get your Serres Natural Gold Batter Mix, visit www.serres.shop for next day free mainland UK delivery. You can also purchase from your favourite wholesaler. So what's stopping you? Give it a try today. Stay updated with Ceres by following us on social media or join our mailing list through the link in the episode show notes. Share this podcast with friends and on social media. And if you like this episode, you never know, your friends in the industry might like it too. So share it with them. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if you have the time. Now, let's dive into today's episode with Dimitri Lawton. Demo, welcome to the podcast. Hi, there you are. How are you? Not too bad, mate. For those that don't know you, tell us who you are and where you're from. I'm uh, Demetrius Lawton. I run Ruddington Fish Bar in Nottingham. Grew up Stafford area. Uh, moved to Cyprus. Moved back to the UK, back to Nottingham. Uh, a lot of you will know that I've worked with me in Sheffield, Mansfield, Stafford, different parts of Birmingham over the years. What year did you move to Cyprus? Um, I moved to Cyprus around 2008. In my adult years, obviously, you know, I spent a bit of time when I was younger in Cyprus, but adult years, I moved back to Cyprus in 2008. How old were you? 2008, I would have been around, well, not around, I would have been, like, or it might have been early in 2008, actually. It would have been 2000, 2007, so I was, I was 25, 24, 25. At the time when I moved to Cyprus. You were working in Stafford before. Was that your dad's fish and chip shop? Well, Stafford, I grew up in Stafford. Okay. Um, I, I left Stafford um late teens early 20s and uh, my my parents retired in in 2007 2008 um they moved to cyprus they'd gone a few months before me and i i, I was running shop i was running a shop in mansfield at the time um that came to an end and at the same time as running shops I, i'd been selling cars in cyprus i think we was having fun doing that and we was making a lot of money at the time. So it just seemed the right time to, to me to make that move back to Cyprus for a bit and see where that took me. I was starting to get a bit bored and fed up of the fish and chip shop game back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, when, you, when you're single, you want free time as well. And life work balance was, was starting to become difficult. So, so it seemed like the right move at the right time. Yeah, well, which is good. And obviously, you went to Cyprus to not be single anymore, uh, which we'll touch on. <laughs> we'll touch on that shortly. <laughs> Funny how things go, eh? But, um, but um, so obviously, you go to Cyprus. So, what what do you think was getting you down the most over here before you went? Was it just you just fancied a change? You just thought, you know what, I just need yeah. a break. You know what? I obviously in my early years, I was I just followed what. I'd seen everybody else doing the fish and chip shops and it was literally graft from morning to night, six days a week. And then on a Sunday, do the jobs that you couldn't do the rest of the week. So it was more of a way of life than a, than a, a career or a job. And I think when you've done that for a few years, especially in your, 
you know, your early 20s, late teens, early 20s to mid 20s, it gets to the stage where you burn yourself out a little bit or or start to think to yourself, well, God, there's got to be more to life than this. I think I was talking to my brother about this the other day. I think at that age, I wonder if when you see at the, in the early 20s, is it when maybe people are going to uni or settling down in jobs and you probably think, well, I'm in fish and chips and I came through it because of family. Or like you said, you know, I didn't know what else I'd do. And you sort of see everyone else is sort of progressing a little bit. And maybe that's a weird blip in your work life when you think, am I happy? And I wonder if that had some effect with you. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's more to do with the fact that the work-life balance, obviously you have to enjoy life. Although I enjoyed fish and chips, I, I, I've always enjoyed doing it. Um, I think it just got to the stage it took over my life too much. And you're thinking to yourself that, you know, there is more to life than this. Yeah. Um, and because we were doing so well in other, in other fields, um, it seemed to be a no, a no brainer really. Or mm. I thought I could maintain the lifestyle that I wanted to maintain. Um, and, and have time to actually enjoy the money we was earning or the things that we were doing. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, so I think growing up, I never knew you. So I only met you on five, six years ago, maybe give or take. So we never, we know people that know each other, but we don't. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a very weird, like I was probably similar to you that I came through the fish and tip industry. And it's, it's fair to say that it's fair to say that everyone in your network would have had a fish and chip shop. Like, you know, pretty I, much everybody. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think we were the generation where we were starting to see the, the, the English Greek children kind of coming through and going to university and actually completing university and doing something with the degrees. Because I think even the, the generation kind of in between us and our parents tend, some of them got degrees and they still ended up in fish and chips. I'm trying to think, I don't think I've got one cousin that went to uni. I might be wrong. Like <laughs> I might be wrong. Like, but I don't think there is. I know a lot of their kids have gone, like, yeah. but I can't think of one. No, I, don't, I have a lot of friends that went to uni, but uh, again, some of them did fall back into the fish and chip industry, and some of them did stay in the in the industry that you know they trained up in, which was That's good. was very different. It was it was something unknown really to us. It wasn't mm. wasn't what we did, was it? No, I guess. Yeah, just different, just different. I sound old talking about this now, but you know, <laughs> it's um, yeah, but yeah. So we didn't. Like, I I didn't know you, and I think about five six years ago, I remember my cousin who sold fish at the time. Yep. Um, he said to me, oh, you know, you'd really get on with. And I was like, no, 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 because you haven't said yet. And he was like, he said, oh, there's a guy called Demo who's got a shop in, in um, Nottingham. I said, all oh, right, that's cool. And then I remember seeing at the time, not so long after, I remember seeing Chris from George's Tradition. And I said, uh, oh, do you know a guy called Demo in Ruddington? And he goes, oh, yeah, he's a good lad. He's a good lad. I don't know why all these people were lying on your behalf because <laughs> you, I have no idea why. But then we finally met, again, on accident at a kid's birthday party, which is strange yeah. that we were both at a kid's birthday party. But, um, and, uh, yeah, I just think, I wouldn't say we hit it off straight away, but I think we've not always, I don't think we've always had the same opinion on things either, which is why I think we always yeah, have interesting yeah. conversations. I think that, yeah. you know, I probably see things from a different side and, you know, but we always challenge each other's ideas. Yeah. Always, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody has different opinions. And... Yeah. Well, Cause we're not all right. Yeah. So that's, that's something I've always yeah. learned. And, um, and I do admit that I probably do see things from a different side sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, like you know, the other day on Friday, cause you forgot to order something. We met up and we're at birds bakery and, and uh, I was fairly happy with what I was eating. And you were like, oh, my God, I'm not happy with this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, mate, chill. <laughs> like, but I guess that's just where everyone's just so different. Like, yeah. and uh, But, yeah, I think one of the biggest things that interests me is sort of I, – I sort of like how you do things quite different at Ruddington. Like, you know, and I, I sort of like to know what formed that thinking. And I think I know some of it but I think it'll be interesting to a lot of others. So you go in Cyprus in 2008. How long were you over there for? Um, I returned in 2014. Okay. So, yeah, six, seven years, seven years probably. Six, seven years. And I remember one of the jobs that you did over there, I think it was just one of the jobs, you worked at McDonald's. And usually for a lot of the time, I wouldn't say that's a really, um, like – I think what I wouldn't usually bring this up in a podcast, but I think what's notable in this in this respect is just the fact that McDonald's in Cyprus was different to McDonald's in the UK. And I think that's because why I bring that up is because 
there wasn't a McDonald's a few years before. And it, and the person who took it to Cyprus, um, he literally got the agency for the whole country and yeah, cut to start. And, master franchise, yeah. Yeah. And he, you know, he took the master franchise. So he started from scratch. So that's really yeah. interesting in my view that, and you've said to me many times, and I thought this is another notable thing. You've said to me many times that you think McDonald's Cyprus leaves McDonald's UK for dead. Um, so I'm always interested in to know why. But what was your sort of, just quickly, just give us a little snapshot. What was your role there? And then how long before you then came back to the UK? Well, at the, at the time, I would, uh, if you remember the banking crisis in Cyprus, the banks... Um, Haircut. And it closed <laughs> left everybody with £100,000 if, if you had anything in your account. Um, but it also became very difficult to move on a daily basis. You could only draw, I think, if my memory serves me right, you could you could draw up to a three hundred pounds, uh, up to three hundred euros out of a cash point. And you weren't allowed to draw anything else. So if you had rent to pay and bills to pay, and everything in Cyprus at the time was paid in cash, you know, there's none of these online systems anymore. Or ice cream to buy because that's that's, <laughs> that's your main that's your main purchases. But God. yeah, it was a favourite in Cyprus. To be honest. <laughs> Um, it became very difficult. And at the time, uh, like I say, things at the time were very different. The, the, when they had that financial crisis, obviously what we were doing with the cars became very difficult. Uh, people couldn't get hold of the money to purchase the cars. And you were sitting here thinking, hold on, I'm not going to pump any more in money into this industry because I could get left with a load of stock that's going to be worth nothing in 12 months or two years. So we had to knock that on the head. Um Obviously, that's when I started debating, do I come back to the UK? Do I find another job, something doing, find, actually find a job and not be self-employed in Cyprus, which I find kind of, I found difficult at the time to think about because they can be quite difficult to work with. And I was talking to a friend that used to be in my class at school. Her, her dad was the master franchisee of McDonald's. And I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for work. I think I'd seen an advertisement they, that they had online for a trainee manager so I rang her up and I said, no, I said, oh, what's this position that, you know, that's been advertised? How does it work? And we had a long chat and I thought, and she said to me, why don't, you know, come on board and see, see how, how you get on, how you like it. And we'll kind of take it from there. Um, and obviously McDonald's as, as a business model is probably second to none in the whole world. Um, I'm not a, a great fan or a great advocate of the food, um, but as a business model, it really is amazing. Um, obviously from a chip shop point of view at the time you're looking at the average sales of chip shops and then looking at the average sales of McDonald's you're thinking how are they doing this on this scale you know how have they grown how have they got to this level on a product that I kind of judge myself and looking and thinking it wasn't great um, and you know here we are offering fish and chips which I thought was a great product at the time and I still do um, and and we can't serve you know, a tenth of the customers that they're serving. What, what's going on? Why is it like that? So I thought, you know what? Forget the wage, forget the fact. Obviously, I still had other incomes from um, property and rental incomes in the UK. So the financial side of working in McDonald's wasn't a big issue for me. Um, it was more of what can I learn from this? What can I find out? It was more out of interest, you know. And obviously, I was... Although you, whoever you are, whatever you do, you have to start at the bottom. You have to start working on the tills. You have to start prep. You have to start closing procedures. You have to start start from the bottom and work your way through the management system and go well. Um, and that's that's what I did. That's pretty different for Cyprus, isn't it? Because usually, if you know the daughter of someone in Cyprus yeah. who owns a company, that's yeah. usually halfway up the ladder in Cyprus. Yeah, but that's not how McDonald's work, though. No, 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 a hundred percent. And no, that, even, it, even they, even they, as the owners, at some stage, would have had to have started yeah. off from scratch. Uh, and maybe that's uh, you know one of the little secrets to, to right. success. Yeah, yeah no, hundred percent. I think one of the things I remember when it was first opening, I think it opened in nineteen ninety seven. I think that store, so roughly mm -hmm. ten years before you got there, mm -hmm. and. I remember the hype, like we left Cyprus in like, cause we lived over there as kids. We left in like 1995, give or take. 
And I think the talk was, oh, it was coming. Like, you know, it was, I know it's still early, but the hype was there. And I remember right. going back a couple, a couple of summers later and the queues for that store on the Finigores, mm-hmm. like, you know, and, and for those that don't know, the Finigores is, is the promenade in Larnaca facing the yeah. beach. It, it's probably even... It would, have been a good, it would have been a good kilometre, maybe. Say, yeah, yeah. The queues were just horrendously long and, yeah. and... It was just mental. And I, we, we were never excited by it because we had McDonald's in our local town. So it was just like, you know. Well, I mean, could you imagine having to try to navigate that? You know, you're opening a brand new store. You don't know if you're going to be busy, if you're going to be quiet. Yeah. Uh, stock levels, staff levels, new but, people that haven't got a clue what McDonald's is. Cast your mind back, though, to the, to Cyprus food, like fast food yeah. in particular. Forget the real food that we eat, which is amazing over there. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. but fast food was always crap, in my opinion. Like, yeah. if you've ever been to, like, you know, areas where you got, like, a, a burger, and it was always tough to eat. And mm-hmm. I, I, the fast food selection pre-McDonald's in Cyprus was dire. Yeah. Like, I mean, dire. And I do think that that whole, yeah. you know... You see, I think it was more society, Estelle, because there wasn't a great call for it. No, there wasn't. Um, no. yeah. You know, so people weren't, you know, companies weren't weren't investing their money into it because there wasn't a market there at the time. No, I, I can understand yeah. why they just didn't see the need. Like, you know. Yeah. So it, and obviously at the time, Cyprus wasn't a European country, so there was not real any great imports of food or things like that. No, no. But I think looking back on it, like McDonald's has sort of like lifted the whole game in Cyprus. Like, right? you know, and I don't, I don't mean the good food. I mean fast yeah. food because there's nothing that, in my opinion, Cyprus has some of the best restaurants food-wise going. I, that's what I think. Like yeah. when it comes to seafood and so on. But I guess you've got to like that sort of thing. Like yeah. I, I remember, I don't know if I ever told you this story once. So a friend of mine, I won't say who it is because you'll you know who he is. I'm not going to say who he is. Yeah. He's in the industry, but he goes, oh, I love Cyprus. Cyprus is brilliant. Like I was like, all right. Yeah, he goes, the food's amazing. I was like, yeah, well, it is. Like, he goes, oh, we go out in Apra every year. My girls love it. My wife loves it. I was like, oh, it's great. He goes, uh, I said, what do you eat when you're over there? He goes, Burger King or McDonald's? And I just looked at him with my health. I just like, I just looked at him and I was like, mate, you're not, you're having me on, ain't you? And he was like, I don't eat none of that foreign mucky goes. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> like, but, but no, it's just, but I, I was amazed that for a while, and I don't know if this is still the case, but the head offices were there as well on the, fin- on, on the, on the, on the main site. Because yeah. when I was about, 1920 give or take my dad decided to punish me for some reason i don't know what he probably doesn't see it as a punishment but he he got my uncle his brother so you know my cousin stelios yeah yeah he got his his dad to take me to go get my exit papers to leave the country yeah and they changed the office that they'd moved the office where it was so he says to me is the owner called michael at mcdonald's i think or, or the Michaelis, ma- yeah, yeah Michaelis, yeah. yeah, the master franchisee. We're just going to say Michael right. for the benefit of the listeners. And, uh, and uh, so we walk upstairs. It, so we're in McDonald's. We walk up the side steps. We go upstairs, and then the office was above that. If I'm right, have I remembered yeah. that correctly? So we go upstairs again, and I'm like Harry. Oh, we always call Harry Harry. It was never Uncle Harry. It was just Harry. It's like where are we going? He goes. Michael's son needed exit papers recently, and I know he knows where the office is. So I, I genuinely just assumed it was going to be. Go upstairs and he'll ask somebody. No, not Uncle Harry. You know what he does? We walk in. We go straight through the reception area, straight through people working on their computers, looking at spreadsheets. And I just see there's a boardroom in front of us. And I just think, shit, he's aiming for the fucking boardroom. Yeah. (laughs) And he just kicks the door in, like literally just barges in. And this guy, the owner, the master franchisee, is doing a presentation to like 12 people. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And he just turns around and he goes, Harry, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, he goes, he goes, Michael, you, your son um, had um, exit papers recently, needed exit papers recently, didn't he? And he goes, but mate, the guy was just confused. Like, yeah. He was like, yeah. He goes, where do I go? Probably, he's probably wondering how he managed to get through everyone. <laughs> yeah, but, well, I've got a theory about that and I'll explain that in a minute. So he just <laughs> literally barges through. Michael's face was a picture and he doesn't know me from Adam, and I hope he forgets me if he remembers. I hope he mm. never knows who I am. Yeah. yeah. And, and he just like, Harry, we're in a meeting, mate. He goes, oh, I need you for a minute. He goes, the mm. quicker you tell me, the quicker I leave. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, well, it's here and here. He tells him where it is. So it turns out that my uncle was actually a, a lorry driver for them for a while. 
Okay. Which probably explains why for a short period of time, they didn't get buns delivered on time. Uh, okay. Because I guarantee you, my uncle would have been like the worst delivery driver ever. Um, that way it doesn't work there anymore. Probably. It doesn't work <laughs> anywhere anymore, to be honest. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. He's pretty much been through all the jobs in Cyprus, bless him. Um, so honestly, he was just terrible. But, you know, I'm convinced that, you know how he got through? Because if you look like you belong somewhere, you just, they've got that confidence about you. You just, yeah. you can do what you want. Like you see it all the time. Like I remember when we started doing um, some delivery, uh, so the, the beginning of sort of us doing online deliveries. I remember in the old van, I did should go to FedEx with a box full of boxes, drive in through the back door. Instead of doing the buzzer, go through the gates, reverse onto the belt with a high vis on and you just start putting stuff on the belt. And because you've got a high vis on, nobody ever says, who are you? They just think <laughs> this guy's putting boxes on and that's it. I remember one, one guy comes over to me one day and goes, we've been trying to figure out for months who the hell you are. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like he goes, you've got all the labels. Everything's bang on. He goes, but who are you? And I was like, Oh, I own the company. Like as in, cause they were trying to figure out, was I a sub, uh, like a subby? And I was just, they were just like, we've never seen anybody just pull up and just do what they're going. And I think my dad's got that about him or did like, he just, he just, if you look like you belong somewhere, yeah. Then people never question you ever. Yeah. Like it's the life lesson, isn't it? it is. Typical Greek attitude. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've seen other people do it. Like my mate James yeah. is exactly the same. He's got this confidence about him. Like he yeah. just, you know, and he just. I think people just. Well, he's pleasant. He's not in the way. He yeah. hasn't effed anybody off. Like so, yeah. Just let him do their job. Yeah. Like, but just confuse people, isn't it? You know, yeah. there's an old saying. I think when my teacher used to say, uh, "Bullshit baffles." I think it was. <laughs> you just kind of walk in as if. Um, as if nothing's happening and everybody's confused. But. Yeah, well, no, they were confused because I'm driving off and they're thinking... I think that's the little bit of Greek you've got in your style, to be honest. Maybe, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe I got it off my dad, I don't know. But I just I just think sometimes when you've got a job that needs doing, you ain't got time to go press the buzzer, wait for someone to ask who you are. So what was it like working at McDonald's? And what was what did your role start off? It was trainee manager. And where did it sort of end before you then... Trainee managers kind of ended at shift manager. Yeah. I was, I, I think they could see that I was adamant that I would have been... I wasn't there for the long term. Maybe um, uh, obviously, I met I met my wife in McDonald's. She was my store manager at the time, um, and then obviously, once she started to, you know, we wanted to have a family and settle down. Things change, especially in the corporate world. You started to think then at that point about well, obviously, back I had to make some life decisions, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, they're now, nobody's ever going to make it easy for you. Yeah. Um, once we had the one, the second one was on the way, and you start thinking, okay, life's great in Cyprus. It's lovely. The weather's nice. But realistically, future-wise, what's there for? Yeah. You know, for 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 my family. Uh, and like I said, once that kind of the, we had the bank, the banks collapsed. You, you just, we just couldn't see a way forward, you know. The, I thought by the time it's going to take ten, fifteen, maybe twenty years to re, to recover from this, and at what stage, what kind of energy am I going to have in my life to start, you know, kind of build again, you know? Um, my brother-in-law at the time and my sister, you know, my brother-in-law had been in a job for like twenty years, and he'd been dropped down to three days a week. Wow! Um, just overnight, so obviously. The wages in Cyprus are low anyway. You know, if you're on, I think the average wage even still now is about 900 euro to 1,000 euro a month. Yeah. You know, if that's halved, how do you survive on that? Yeah. I could, so I, I was okay only from the rental income from the UK, but obviously it wasn't really ideal sustainably going forward over a long period of time. Um, not if I wanted to provide a future for my, my kids anyway. No, you know? 100%. So, what do you think, looking back on it now, as an older person, what do you think, well, you know, just someone who's looking back, you've been in another business for a while, what do you think were the key things that you learned working within a McDonald's? Like, what did it afterwards, what did it sort of um, frame you know, in your brain? Where, where, do you, where do you start with that? <laughs> you know, um, it's very difficult as, um, as, a, uh, as a business owner to go and work within a business of someone else. I think this is why everybody, a lot of big companies, if they look at people's CVs and they see self-employed over a long time, um, they're a bit dubious about maybe hiring them on a salaried or skilled job. Um, it's very difficult going to work for somebody else when you've worked for you 
for yourself all your life, pretty much. Um, obviously, I've worked for other people. Um, when I was learning the trade, I was going around, you know, people's shops, working with different people, taking the things that I liked from the way they worked and, you know, creating my own kind of image. Um, but actually working full-time within somebody else's business is a totally different thing. Uh, just the structure, you know, the things that you... McDonald's is huge, you know, and just because you're a single a single unit or you've got two or three units, you still need structure within any business, you know. And I think this is where a lot of the shops are, are struggling is a lot of the shops haven't got a structure because we're only small businesses, you know. Some shops have only got three, four employees. Um, but you still need some kind of structure. Somebody still needs to do the marketing. Somebody still needs to do the accounting. Somebody needs to, to develop your menu, to develop the foods. You can't keep the menu the same. Um, and on top of this, they have to stay on top of, you know, plan maintenance and all these kind of the, the general running of the business. But unless there's some kind of structure there, you know, it, and on a strong foundation, it, it's done. It, it's done business really over the long term, isn't it? So, do you think that's one of the things that you learned in that environment was just having systems in place, structure, well, processes? I, I, I went. I went from a shop at, at the time, at the time, which was a relatively busy shop, you know, a relatively good shop twenty years ago, taking you know seven, eight thousand pound a week, maybe, um, to go in and walking into stores that were taking you know, up to 35,000 euro a day. And now to get that into your head on a five euro average spend is, is mind boggling. Yeah. You know, how, how do you do if, if I'm, you're talking to say, if I was to go and talk to somebody, <clears throat> your average Joe in a fish and chip shop now and say, okay, if I was to give you this custom tomorrow, what would you do with it? How would you do it? Where would they start? Yeah. You know, with no operations, with no structure in the business, it's a recipe for disaster, isn't it, really? What's amazing is that nobody thought that McDonald's was really going to be a success. McDonald's 40 years ago was saying, you know, our, 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 sorry, you know, probably 30 years ago, was saying our end game is to have a McDonald's within three miles. You can go to any McDonald's within three mile radius. Yeah. They can't be far off that now. Well, I, think, I think I quit the other day. I think they're into 25 stores, 26 stores. Um, I think you, in, oh, this is oh sorry UK. this is in Cyprus sorry sorry, oh, okay, like, yeah. sorry. obviously in the UK I think that's 1400 ish I think yeah, yeah. but I mean you, you're talking their end, end goal was like we're going to have a McDonald's within a, a radius of every three miles and you're sitting there thinking nah that's impossible it's never but they can't be far off yeah I think and there might be some rural areas there isn't you know that but you go into any city or town yeah I think this is why a lot of people in my village are upset with your village in Cyprus because you have a McDonald's and we don't. So yeah, I think there's a few <laughs> more reasons, but we're not going to mention that on the podcast. So yeah, but no, I think one of the one of the things I saw in the group the other day, I don't know if you saw it. Um, they were, they were talking about Good Friday in the fish and chip groups the other day, and someone said something like, "Someone said something like, um, if only people." No, why don't people slate McDonald's? They couldn't do what we do on Good Friday. And I just thought about it for a moment and I thought... Really? Yeah, well, yeah. So I think what, I think he mentioned a figure the person did as well. I think he said something like £1,000 in three hours. Whereas I, I remember one of the McDonald's franchises that I know, she said to me that one of the quietest stores that she's got, that takes about £4,500 an hour just through the drive through and that is a ridiculous amount of money. And it's like you said, like if you was to say to somebody, we're going to allow you to make, let's say five thousand pounds an hour, where do you even start from? Like because, yeah. you know, a can your range cope? Can your staff cope? What systems have you got in place? No, but would they? If if you say to them, you know, we'll give you that, we'll give you that, and we'll we'll give you a budget of say four hundred thousand pounds, five hundred thousand pounds to get your shop in a state that can take that kind of money. And we'll give you three months to organize it. Would they still be able to do it? I think without the McDonald's machine behind you, probably not. Well, it's very, it's very, very simple still. It's unbelievable how simple it actually, how sim, how Mac, how simple McDonald's have made it. Should I put it that way? Yeah. Um, it's a very, very complex business model. And like I said before, you know, it's second to none, but, um, 
when you actually work in there, a little bit of common sense, everything is very, very simple. Yeah. Well, I think my niece worked there for a little while while she was studying locally. And she said that 90% of her work, so 90% of her shifts when she was there, was just doing cold drinks. Nothing else, just cold drinks. And and I think she was getting paid, like, at the time when she was, let's say, 18, maybe. She was on, like, 980 an hour or something like that. Like, And all she had to do, she says, for, like, a four-hour shift was just cold drinks, nothing else. So then when you then look at that labor force, and I know that's just her, but let's say someone else, all they've got to do is do burgers and someone else has just got to do fries and someone else has just got to be on the window for a shift. And obviously there's other roles. I'm just thinking of the ones at the top of my head. Yeah, look, we can all, we can all do that. We can all manage that. But then it comes to the fact where let's face it, the labor is a labor figure. So it's, it's a percentage of what you, what you're planning to take or how many customers you're planning to serve. So you've got another part of management in that you have to manage. Um, it's not just about putting people there. They have to be serving a purpose. Yeah. No, exactly. it, has to be, it has to be financially viable yeah, and it has to be managed. Yeah. But who's going to manage it if you're stuck on the fryer all day long? Well, yeah, that's true. And I think, well, in our industry, I think we almost feel like the guy behind the fryer is like, you know, King Dick, the boss. Yeah. Like, you know, him, you know, you yeah. <laughs> know, <laughs> but I remember Andrew, who was at George's Tradition, he said to me, back then, a while back, when we started dealing with him, like, he said, look, you know, our fryers sometimes are just fryers and a manager might be someone else in the business. A fryer is a fryer though. Like it's just yeah. a job. Like, whereas I think sometimes you see it today where people are, I want a manager, but that's a fryer. Like they've, they've blended the two roles and yeah. you know, is that asking too much from people? Are we, are we holding up the fryer guy? Like as is the, the, the guy who controls everything because well, look, you, you can either be, you can either be cooking a fish or, 20 fish or whatever it is you're cooking or you can be dealing with a customer that's got an issue or you could be you can be pushing the tills if you know the tills are overloaded or if the delivery system's overloaded or you can collect obviously you know going back to mcdonald's they always used to kind of say you know the manager is the fire extinguisher of the shop Mm. you know so the manager has to be free in the shift to be able to deal with the problems that's the whole point of managing yeah you know, if, you, if you're stuck on the fryer, you're only seeing probably 10, 20% of what's actually going on in the background. Yeah, well, this is true. And how can you be a good manager if you of people if you're trying to actually deal with cooking lots of product to keep knocking out, you know? Well, no, no, no you, you're always going to be restricted to what your two hands can do and what you, yeah. or what you can physically handle as one person. Um, ultimately, what you tend to see that happens is you end up, restricting the shop you know or stopping the shop from growing or mm. uh, because you're the one holding it back i know we don't like to admit it or we don't like to look at it ourselves you're the bottleneck yeah well you're the, you're the one that's you're the one that's holding the shop back just because you know whatever the reason whether it's a vanity issue or whether it's <clears throat> um you think nobody can do it as good as you or whatever the reason there's hundreds if you speak to people in the industry there's hundreds and hundreds of different reasons for it but ultimately let, until we start learning to work through other people, um, we're, we're never, the business is never going to grow or it'll get to a certain extent and then just stop. I think there's a few things. I don't, I, I'd say, I don't think vanity is all of it. I think I remember my dad's generation. Like I remember I when I started working in the shop and I started to manage one of them, Like mm-hmm. I remember training another guy to fry on busy shifts and then I'd be the spare guy. I'd be like, empty the till, making sure the kebabs were okay, making sure everything was flowing. I'd be getting food to him if he needed it, making sure the staff are okay f- around the front because it was an island range. And I remember him coming in one Friday and he's like, this ain't right, you should be behind the range. I was like, he's doing more than me. I've trained him to do more than me. And all he's got to do, Darren, his name was, the guy is an absolute legend. He's, he's not with us anymore. He's in the army now. And, uh, and he was like pushing out more product than I could because – I was doing everything else and I wanted to be the yeah. spare guy. And I think the uh, older generations won't accept that. No, they, no. Will just, they will think you're trying to be lazy. You don't want to do yeah, it. No, it's exactly what he thought. He just thought you're, <laughs> a li- yeah. Yeah. you know, he always used to say that. Like if you ask my dad now, he probably thinks the reason I did Sarah's is because I was too lazy to work in the chip shop. Yeah. Which is probably partly true. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that. So, that real- <laughs> yeah. And, and um, so I do think that, you know, but I was always like, you know what, if I can get other people to do a better job than me, I don't need to be the best here at Fry. I've got nothing to prove here. Like, you know, for me, it was always about, 
utilizing well, ultimately you need to know enough to be the best at every station yeah. if necessary yes but that doesn't mean that you have to do every no. station all of the time no exactly. all together at the same time you know it doesn't make sense and i think we're the only industry that i've seen that tries to do this all the time and shoots ourselves in the foot and it, it's stressful be, working like that as well it's tiring yeah yeah exactly and uh yeah it's a lot to do because i'd imagine you probably don't look forward to busy days because you're thinking, I'm stuck on my own, I'm either short-staffed, I'm doing everything. Well, I don't think you look forward to any days. I think ultimately maybe that's what happened to me when I left in the first mm. place, I went to Cyprus, was you kind of think, God, all day, every day, the same thing, same problems. Um, you know, it gets a little bit monotonous. You know, there's more to life than that, and, and there is. But unless you, you want to spend – you can spend your time working all day, or all day, all night, or you can spend some time training and teaching other people and – uh, allow the business to grow and flourish you know yeah one of the things that we do see a lot of now and i know mcdonald's staff tend to get a real bad rap but i tell you what the staff that i employed from mcdonald's over the years in this is our, in our local area of the neat and bedworth area i tell you what there's some of the cleanest staff i've ever seen like they're like robots i mean like um like there was one girl kim and i remember we have a really busy thursday uh, and then it was really uh, her next day was a Friday and we just got rid of like the tea time rush. And then she literally we just, we, you know, you just take a moment to just like decompress for a second. And she walks out the back and I think, where's Kim going? I thought she was going for a cigarette break on her own without telling anybody. And it comes back with a bowl of water, just starts cleaning down. And she's just like, we've got to clean down now. We've got to get ready for the next shift. And I was like, I looked at her, I thought, bloody hell, like, She's a smart cookie. like, and, I, and she said to me something that I read in the book afterwards. But it well, was like, Ultimately, somebody would probably have taught her this. Yes. You know, if she hasn't exactly. been taught this, then... Yeah. And, and, and she said to me, because there's a saying that you use at McDonald's, which I now know the saying because I've read the books, and it's like, if there's time to lean, there's time to clean. And, and mm. straight away, she was just like, clean down everything. And honestly, it put us all to shame because at that moment, we're all like, yeah, we just had a busy shift. And for her, it was probably like nothing. Because, again, her turnover at, at per hour was probably more than most shifts. At, you know. Well, I think ultimately it depends on the operator you work for, Stella. And it's the same in every industry, probably. You know, there's good and bad operators in, in McDonald's, as there is in fish and chips, as there is in retail, as there is in everywhere you go. But, um, yeah, we were quite lucky. The management in McDonald's in Cyprus is second to none. I'm going to pick you up on something that you've told me many times. Why do you think McDonald's in Cyprus leaves McDonald's UK for dead? Management. Yeah. Sim it's very, very simple. Management. They're strict. They were strict at the time, but everybody was pulling in the same direction. Okay. You know, for the same goal. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of staff. It was very different to the UK. Uh, in Cyprus, there was a massive influx of of foreign workers um, that really needed their job. You know, it wasn't a case of um, wanting to. It was a case of if they didn't have that job, they would go hungry. And you wouldn't just walk out of that job straight into another job. You know, in the UK, a lot of people can just walk out of a job straight into another job, especially in this industry. Um, and it's kind of like take it or leave it. We used to... When they used to come come to Cyprus, operations managers from other from other areas, you know, Asia or or Europe, or it's one came from China. The once I remember, and, and and you see the productivity um, of other countries, it's mind boggling. Mm. You know, we we had really really good results uh, service times and or all the you know FORs and SORs that we used to do. Obviously, all the results are always shared with with other countries and McDonald's, and we we competed really well against all of East Asia, all of um, you know the countries we that we used to speak with. But when you see the productivity of some of the the the, the less well off European countries, China and places like that, it's unbelievable what they can do with two or three people yeah. that we were needing five to seven people to have the same kind of productivity and we we were doing well yeah well i you guess know, we, when we look at them in the uk and we see the amount the productivity especially me and anna both looking at it obviously knowing what we're looking at we just stand there shaking our heads and you're thinking god how can you go from that to that same company same rules same 
And I think, it, you know, it, it's society. Do you think that's because, so a couple of things, do you think that's because the consumers in Cyprus demand more? Or do you think that they're afraid of being... I don't know, I'm just thinking broadly here. They're a master franchisee, which means they've got to have higher standards and they don't want to get that revoked. No, not necessarily. Um, uh, or is it just, was he driven by the, the, the whole company? No, I, I think for, from what I, I know from Mihaly, he, he was, he initially took McDonald's on in Germany. So it was, obviously he learned, he was trained in a totally different mentality. Um, you know, German mentality to the UK, to Cyprus is totally different. But he carried that on in Cyprus. Yeah. And he, in, he instructed that through through his children who all worked in the company. And then his children flowed it through to the staff, to the other managers. And everybody in the company was hungry to go forward or to keep their job. Yeah. You know, we, we, we tend to find in the in the UK, there's a lot of shoulder shrugging going on. You know, you, you see people whether they can't be bothered to work, whether they don't need to work, whether they've got it too easy or they've never gone hungry. Um, it produces a different type of person. Yeah. Well, I'd yeah. imagine, I'd imagine that the workforce in let's say UK, Europe, America is probably a bit more relaxed than, you know, the likes of Cyprus and the Middle East and Asia. Well, you know, a lot of these uh, a lot of these workers were from Bulgaria, Romania, um yeah, they came from all over Europe really. But they they had respect for their job. Mm. But like I said, I think a lot of that was instilled from fear of losing it. Possibly or fear of going yeah. hungry, you well, know. Well they came um, to work, didn't they? They came to work if they've come from yeah. A, yeah. yeah. So. Um and they weren't earning a great deal of money, very, very little money. They were maybe just about making ends meet, you know, but they were making ends meet. The alternative was going hungry. I'm still shocked after all these years in Cyprus. This is just a general note on Cyprus, not McDonald's. I'm still shocked that Cyprus can still get away with such low wages, being in the European Union and everything. I find it incredible. Um, this is just a wider note. It's got nothing to do with McDonald's. Yeah, it's the, yeah. well, obviously, <laughs> the pie is that big and it's got to be shared. That And that's just how, you know. Yeah. If you look, yeah. you know, if you look in England now, What's the minimum wage now for a twenty-one-year-old? Eleven-ish, eleven fifty, something like that. And um, you know, that's for a thirty-seven-hour week on the best part in, in Cyprus. You're looking, what's that? A quarter of that? A fra fraction yeah, of that? You see that, but life's more expensive in the UK as well. Oh, some things, yeah. some things are more expensive in Cyprus. Some things are more expensive over here. And, yeah, Cyprus. Yeah, Cyprus isn't a cheap place to live, though. It's not. It's not you know, no, it's a cheap place to live. You think? Uh, Definitely, you haven't got the council tax bills that you've okay. got over here. Uh, you know all these things that we end up paying in the UK ridiculous amounts of money for things that we're not getting anything back for. Whether it be council tax, road tax, tax this, tax that, it costs you more. It costs you as much to die as it does to live in the UK at the moment. Uh, <laughs> are, you, are you suggesting the potholes are not meant to be there? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I told, me, told me that, that it's uh, it's to slow the cars down. Well, they're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> because I nearly, I, I was afraid for my life a few weeks ago. I was visiting yeah. Mark Petru in Chatteris and I must have driven through a three mile long pothole. Yeah, well, uh, Nottingham's pretty bad. I don't know if you went through <laughs> it the other day. But... It's got that bad in Nottingham that thieves are struggling to steal cars. <laughs> <laughs> so, make it. so you come back to the UK. I'm intrigued to know what made you choose Nottingham as your home. No, not just home, sorry, your business home. What made you go there? Because to many, it's a difficult trading place. It's East Midlands. Um, I don't think so. I think Nottingham's a great trading place. No, no, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not great. I'm just yeah, saying it's I, I just think what I think is from, from our experience and from what I see in and around me is um, – <sighs> The better operators, the better shops, not just in fish and chips, in everything, always seem to come to the top in Nottingham. Mm. Um, I think to operate and operate well in Nottingham and be successful, you you have to kind of back up your pricing, back up what you're offering um, with the customer gets at what they're paying for, you know. Yeah. It, it, you can't be blasé. 
there's a lot of competition all over Nottingham. Again, not just fish and chips in every industry. One of the things that I wanted to explore shortly as well is that you've always sort of said, I have lots of competition, but they're not all chip shops. And yeah, yeah definitely. I, think, I mean, obviously we have got lots of chip shops here. Yeah. Good chips. Um, but I really do think the competition in fish and chips, other fish and chip shops are probably the, the smallest part of the competition that we have. Yeah. You know, the biggest problems, you know, that we're going to have and going forward are, are your Greg's, your Subway, um, your big brands that I seem have come out of the city centres into suburbs and small towns. And obviously it's it's difficult for a small operation, even a big operation, to compete with these companies. Yeah, because I'd imagine years ago, like the likes of Greg's, for argument's sake, wouldn't have looked at a site in a look in in with a population of let's say twenty thousand or thirty thousand, whereas now they're like, no, we'll we'll do that. Well, within within two miles here, I've got three Greg stores, yeah. three Greg stores, two Subway stores, uh, three McDonald's. Um, you got KFC. You got KFC. I've got there's a KFC, and that's that's on top of all your other your cob shops, your Indian food, shops, Chinese your Indian, food. yeah, you know. Co-ops, co-ops. If ever you go into a co-op now and see their see their sandwich fridges, they're nearly as big as their their aisles for bread and you know eggs and all that. It's, yeah. So again, that is big competition. Yeah. So describe me the menu at Ruddington Fish Bar because it's quite broad. So give mm-hmm. us an example of some of the items that are on your menu. Well, obviously, with us, I I took on an existing store. Yeah. Um. So I've kind of took the the menu that was already existing there and and branched it out, made a few change things that I thought were for the better, um, and it's worked. But we do everything from pizzas to kebabs to fish and chips. So one of the main motivations, I guess, back then when you saw Ruddington Fish Bar for sale or when you heard it was for sale, I guess mm. it was the fact that it's in Ruddington. You quite like that about it. Well, when you come in, obviously, to the UK with a family, the first thing you have to look at is, obviously, the amenities, the schools and things that are in the area. So it, it had to be somewhere um, where I, I was happy to bring my children up. Yeah. Um, coming to Nottingham, for me, was really a no-brainer because although I'd looked at shops in Birmingham and stuff and, and all over the place, for me, Nottingham, I'd spent a lot of time in in my late teens, early twenties going out. Um, it felt like a second home really. And it, for me, it's got that good, that balance of city life, rural life, all my friends, a lot of my friends were, were up this area as well. And yeah, it was, maybe it was just destiny, you know, it was yeah. meant to be and that's it. So then you, you, you take over the shop and what do you do straight away? Do you, you obviously you've bought a goodwill, you know, do you start ripping it apart or, or initially are you just doing what the person who had it before you, is that what you're doing first? Cause I don't really know much about how you took on the shop. So what was your first sort of goal? Well, I, I literally started ripping the, ripping the shop to bits. It was okay. difficult at the time. So like I said, we came, I was moving from Cyprus. I didn't have a, I didn't have a massive budget behind me and I didn't have a choice. I had to make it work. It was a, you know, failure wasn't an option. Um, the shop needed a lot of work. I paid top dollar for the shop because it was where I wanted to be, not just business wise, family wise. Obviously, now if I was looking at second or third store, I'd be looking at it maybe with different, looking for different things out of the shop. But with this being my base, um, it had to meet certain criteria. Needed a lot of work, and we literally, with the funds that we had, ripped it back. Between us, we were doing it ourselves, me, my brother in law, and my dad. And, um, we were literally working till at the time back then we used to open the shop Monday to Thursday until 10 o'clock Sat, uh, Friday, Saturday used to open till 12 o'clock, but they wouldn't let us shut the door before half past 12, one o'clock. Wow. Um, we was literally closing the store, doing some work, fixing walls, fixing floor ceilings, floors, every, it literally needed ripping out and starting again, but I didn't have the money to do it all. Well, that's every startup story, though, isn't it? Well, well, for the first couple of months, yeah, it was literally I was working all the hours God send. I was sleeping yeah. for a couple of hours. We was coming back downstairs from 7 to 11, um, you know, prep, work, balancing it, trying to juggle everything and, and just go forward like that. 
Yeah. And that, that's pretty normal though, isn't it? Like surely mm. yeah, everyone's got to put those hours in to really turn the business around, haven't they? Yeah. Look in hindsight, but like we say, hindsight, um, we're all millionaires in hindsight, aren't we? So mm. um, in hindsight, it would be easier to start from scratch. Definitely. But, um, but plus I- you, you're starting totally with your own, um, you'll have your own brand image. Sometimes if a store hasn't maybe got the image that you want it to have, it's also difficult to turn that around, change people's opinions. It took time. It took a bit of humble pie, you know, people coming in at the beginning, giving us opinions of previous operators or previous earnings, kind of thinking, but, oh, God, swallow it, you know, don't say anything. But also, would you ever like to start from zero, as in trading from zero? Now, now I would love to start from zero. Okay, all right. Now I would love to start a shop from scratch, knowing what I know now, um, definitely. Um, if I know if I were to... If I was to go, if I was to go to another store, then I, probably eighty percent that would be the way I'd go. Unless, obviously, it was a store. I really if you ever went, buy. if you went somewhere else and started with an empty site, do you envisage your menu being similar, or would it be a lot simpler and a lot cleaner? Um, oh, there'd be a few changes, maybe. I'm not sure that the pizzas um, work on a high level in fish and chip shops. Um, Obviously, this was originally, this was a pizza shop and a fish and chip shop, and it was turned into one, um, I think, to help the operator at the time, and we've just kind of carried it on like that. Um, we contemplated taking the pizzas off the menu. We did take them off the menu during lockdown because it just didn't work at the time um, with social distancing and all that. Um and I, I'm not so sure that I'd put the pizzas into a, a shop into another store. Well, you've got no issue with doing a separate pizza store because you know how to do the pizza business, I take it. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. 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 Um, and like I say, it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, obviously the preparation times of a pizza compared to the pre- preparation times of fish and chips and kebabs, you've got kebabs to navigate with that as well, or three totally different concepts. And like I say, when it's easy... When, sorry, when it's when it's quiet, it's easy. Yeah. Everything's easy when it's quiet. But when it gets busy, trying to bring all them three together, incorporating delivery systems and click and collects and customers on the tills becomes logistically difficult, you know. Yeah. It's one of those things that we were talking about the other day, wasn't it? That everyone does things on and they think, Oh, you know what, it's great. And then a Friday comes, then all the wheels just fall off because they yeah. planned they did all their tests on a Monday and a Tuesday, or they were closed at lunchtime and they didn't really think yeah. about it. But then the, the true test is when you're busy. Um, I have to think there's a, a friend of mine who's got a shop and uh, he literally does 22 hours a week frying time. Um, yeah. He uh, closed Saturday night, closed Sunday, closed Monday, mm-hmm. um, only sells fish and chips, doesn't do kebabs. I think he yeah. does two pies a week for an old lady across the road. Yeah, and it's probably touching double figures. Like, and you think to yourself, all he's got to think about is said for that, isn't yeah, they? Yeah, 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 actually... yeah. And yeah. and he just knock out product, knock out product, knock out product. All yeah. he's got to think about is, have I got enough fish? And you know, when he starts a shift, is have I got enough oil? And you know, and yeah, yeah but... you know, you have different. He'll have different problems in his. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Close that many hours, and you you you've got a little bit of fish left over. What do you do? You yeah. know, yeah, no, hundred percent. You know, he'll have obviously problems in his store, maybe that. Yeah, everyone's got. No, I'm not. not I'm not getting su- hours and vice versa. I'm not suggesting that no one has no problems. Business is. Mm. I, I always say business is just like it's a constant puzzle, and it's your job to constantly, you know, fix that puzzle. And um, yeah. you know, there, there's no such thing. If you haven't got a hard decision today, you'll have one tomorrow. So you know. Well, look, along with problems, yeah, but it comes opportunity. Yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, exactly. But no, it's, it? it, it's interesting because obviously. You know, I, I'm always very interested. I've got a lot of customers in your neck of the woods, East Midlands. Um, we had obviously Cod Scallops on a few weeks ago. We've had him on before. We've had George's Tradition on. Um, hopefully, he'll come on again. You and there's others. And you think it, it's an interesting trading area because I think it's it's one of those areas that like when you mentioned Birmingham earlier, I think that I think fish and chips is far more appreciated in the East Midlands than it is in the West Midlands. So Mm -hmm. I think you made a good choice there. I think that, you know, as you start to go sort of East Midlands and upwards, I think people do appreciate fish and chips. I don't know if that's true as much as it was years ago in the West Midlands. I'm not suggesting there isn't good shops because there is good shops in the West Midlands. Yeah, yeah, it's a great shop. Yeah, but I just think that on the whole, 
people appreciate fish and chips a bit more on the east side of the Midlands. Yeah, possibly. Obviously, you you, you look at the cultural di- diversity of Birmingham to uh, to parts of Nottingham or Derbyshire, um, and it's, it's it's very different. Yeah, um, you know, obviously, depending on area, every area is different. Um, but with uh, you know, with diversity in cultures, also brings diversity in foods and diversity in what people are looking for. Yeah. Um, so I think what, what they found in Birmingham is that everything's just been diluted. You know. Um, and obviously, when you, you bring other 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 foods, other cuisines into the market, naturally we're going to try that, and yeah. if we like it, we're going to shop there as well. You know, so it works kind of both ways. You know, you'll gain some, you'll lose some. But yeah. I, I think ultimately, still, whatever industry you're in, whatever business you're in, the cream always comes to the top. Yeah, I agree. Um. So for the operators that kind of keep on top of their game and keep giving the customers what they're what they're looking for, they'll always they'll always be busy. What do you think were your biggest challenges getting Ruddington on its feet? And, and I say Ruddington Fish Bar, not the, not the town. What do you think your biggest challenges were? Do you think it was COVID or was it some other things on the way? I don't. I don't think I see it. Like I said before, I don't really see. I call challenges opportunities, really, in, yeah. in, in especially in this industry. Um, obviously, COVID coming out of COVID was a challenge. Um, going in, going into the lockdown and coming out was was definitely a challenge because we changed the way we operated so drastically. Uh, and you know, everybody in COVID was opinionated. You were trying to keep everybody happy. Everybody sees things different and. Or well, one part of you is supposed to be social distancing, the next part of you is supposed to be serving, you know, however many customers are now you're supposed to be serving. It does it just doesn't add up, does it? You know. Um and then when I we started the online systems pretty early. So there was nobody to kind of go to and say, guys, how do you do this or how do you do that? You know, like we see now on in some of the, the groups and everybody's asking for advice and nobody really had educated advice. Uh, on how to set these systems up, best way to operate, um, best aggregators to go with. Is it best to go with their aggregators or with your own system? And and pre-COVID, we didn't have really much of a social media uh, audience either. So how do you get the message out? Yeah. You know, of what you plan on doing and how is it going to work? And like I said, the experience I had from McDonald's really kind of put me a few steps ahead. Yeah. You know, went back to it, looked at it operationally, looked at it structurally, and and built it slowly, slowly, just dis- di- dissecting each little aspect of it <clears throat> and making sure that all the cogs kind of ran smoothly. Yeah, that makes sense. And I remember lo- lots of conversations we were having over that period. Like, you know, you were a details person. You were trying to get all the details right. Mm. And, and, you know, if that made it that you made a decision a bit late, a day late, you know, you're still early on the scheme of things, but you wanted to make sure that the decision was made properly. Yeah, look, we had we had a good business. We had a, a great image, local image. Our customers were really happy in general. Um, and again, maybe you go back to the vanity of it. You don't want to lose that. You know, I didn't want to open my store and fall flat on my face. Yeah. Um, you know, because everybody would have just been standing there ridiculing and you think, oh, God, this is just, it's not enough that we're working for nothing because we've just messed it all up. Um, we've also got to listen to everybody's opinion about it as well. Yeah. Um, and I know once I started getting into it, within a couple of days, everybody was kind of ringing me up for advice, asking how, how I was doing. I'm like, guys, I'm, I'm, li- I'm trying to work through it myself. So, you know, don't take what I'm telling you um, as gospel because – my advice is as good as your advice, really, at the moment. Mm, yeah. But I guess, you know, everyone made it through. But the business has changed now to some degree. It's a lot more digital focused. Um, people have higher standards, maybe. Maybe customers are a bit more, no, a bit less patient, um, especially post-COVID. Whether that's because of COVID or it's just an excuse, who knows. Um, but now you're on aggregators. You've got um, online ordering. Um, are these things here to stage? I think. I think definitely. You know, society's changed, hasn't it? Mm. 
uh, obviously businesses and serv- um, services provided by businesses are only going to be relative to to the market yeah you know, what people are looking for what people are asking for and who knows how it's going to change in the future yeah we, we, you know, we're seeing little delivery bots and ai seems to be becoming huge all over the world now how's that going to change our industry yeah um, it's probably a bit early to be able to tell we'll wait for the McDonald's of the world to, to, to see how they're going to do it and probably follow, pick a few things up off that maybe, or see how other industries deal with it. Yeah, no, no, a hundred percent. It's tricky. It is very tricky what to know what to do, but the good thing is there are software, there is software out there that starts to come together for you and then you yeah. can buy it or whatever, or rent it, however it is. And off you go. Um, you, you've got, which aggregators you use there or work with? Um, obviously we've got our own platforms. Yeah. And, um, we use Uber Eats and delivery. We did have just eat. Um, but we took that out. What made you sideline that one? And keep the other two? Sorry. What made you sideline just eat and keep the other two? Um, we were, we were constantly getting problems with customers. I don't know why, um, not with customers, with drivers. Yeah. Um, and they always seem to be just eat. Um, obviously we know the problem. We know if we have a problem with our operation or what we're doing, um, but for some reason, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure whether just eat was actually allowing them to collect more orders. And we were opening some of the, just, we, were, we, we got to the stage we was taking some of the just eat orders to the car to find out what they'd got in the car because Customers were saying, oh, you know, 45 minutes and we haven't had the food. And we're thinking, well, you're a mile away from the store. You know, and sometimes we're opening the boots of cars and they've got like nine orders in the back of these cars. And obviously it's going to take time. But I wasn't prepared to allow the the image of our brand um, be tarnished by the operations of Just Eat or any other aggregator by by that matter. And and the other two have been fine? Yeah, you get you're always going to have your odd niggles with some drivers um, or some, you know, like you will with some staff or some customers or some, yeah. you know, but in general, they seem to work smoother in this area. I know obviously from speaking to other people, it's the other way around. I think it generally is just areas, maybe yeah. different areas work better with different aggregators. Did you manage to pass on um, the price difference to the customers? Okay. You know, like, yeah. yeah. The surcharge, yeah, yeah. So you, oh, you have to. There's no, there's no two ways about that. As long as, you, as long as you're offering the customer a sensible alternative, you know, from there on, it's up to the customer. But you can't ultimately, because if we, if you give in to the the pressure of the aggregator to kind of all oh, just be this much more expensive, or the, you know, when if obviously if you're the same price as the store, which is you can't be anyway. Um, it's going to be busier. So it's going to take a larger percentage of, of your takings. You can't afford for 50% of your takings to not be profitable. No, it just doesn't work. It's a business, you know? So ultimately you have to pass on the cost of the commission. I know ultimately if you've got other bigger stores or bigger chains, then you might have other agreements in place, but we have to accept, you know, we haven't got a hundred stores and we're not doing you know, 300 customers a day and things like that. So we have to work within the parameters that we're given. Now, uh, the, I picked up pretty quick on this during lockdown because obviously as soon as we we launched, we come out of lockdown and we launched Uber Eats only before we launched our own platform. And it was pretty scary how quick or how much of the actual business they, they took or they were, they were, they were given. Bringing to you, yeah. Yeah, they were bringing. Obviously, them customers weren't. I know they like to tell you that it's their customers, but ultimately, at that time, that specific time, they were our customers, most yeah. of them. Um, and I jumped on that pretty quick. I obviously realized we sat with the accountant, had a look, and I realized that you know putting your price up twenty five, thirty percent just wasn't enough. It didn't cut oh, it. We we sat down many times and had that conversation, and then we built yeah. a spreadsheet together and we got it sorted, and yeah. and then. Because they, a lot of people, let's say their their delivery, not delivery, uh, just the charges was seventeen percent. Let's say that's a figure mm. I can remember from back then. Yeah, people were adding seventeen percent. 
and that just wasn't really covering their costs. And if you're using their drivers, though, it's more like 25, 30 percent, depending yeah. on what human you have in place. I yeah. think at the time, I remember the biggest figure I can remember was 37 percent. I don't know who that was for, but I'm guessing that was for a full service, you know, like delivery, mm-hmm. the lot. So yeah, you, you know, adding just that to the figure isn't going to cover it because. Well, no, but I think that this is going to be one of the big hurdles going forward. And ultimately, we are going to see a few shops that are going to disappear just because they haven't got this right. And yeah. I think they've just been bullied by some of the aggregators into – it's kind of a vicious circle where the aggregators go, oh, just put 20% on, just put this. And then all of a sudden, you're starting to get a lot of orders coming through, but they're not profitable orders. So what's the point in doing them? Yeah. You know, so – um you just give half of your business away, if not more than that. After 12 months, you kind of sit and look at it and realize, hold on, my business isn't profitable. I can earn more money working in wherever local supermarket. Yeah. And, but you've just lost your business. Yeah. Because one, you t- they're too scared to s- take the aggregator out and go back to how it was before because they think they're going to lose all that trade. Um, And then on the other hand, they're too scared to put the prices up again because they think they're going to lose customers. Well, well, you're better off having 20 customers that are profitable than 40 customers that aren't, you know. Yeah. And I guess you're not talking about being competitive and, and, and being, um, you know, having good marketing and good deals. What you're talking about is the difference between being profitable and being completely not no, it's profitable. Business. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if the business isn't profitable, there's no business there. No, exactly. Um, and, you know, you need to be profitable. If you're going to compete in the modern day, the modern age, there needs to be enough money there, not just to feed you, but to re- refit your shop when it needs refitting, to fix your range when it needs fixing, you know, to uniform your staff, to market your product, to buy good quality products rather than the cheapest thing that's on the market. Yeah. Well, I guess you want to differentiate yourself. So if you're just buying the crappiest of something, and again, I'm just generalizing massively here. Mm. There's not a unique difference there, is there? Customers aren't going to come in and be like, oh, you know what? That thing that I have from here, that curry sauce or the peas or yeah. nuggets, whatever. I'm just thinking, like, if it doesn't inspire them to come back, then what's the point? Oh, yeah. Man. So you can all be one hit wonder. Well, this is it. So post COVID, mm. we then saw inflation. Um, but there was a brief period when everything was pretty cheap over COVID, but then there wasn't a lot of customers either. So that wasn't great. Um, but how did you manage to keep a lid on inflation? Well, at least as much as you could, obviously there's only so much you can control, but how did you also keep- at, at the time it was just hemorrhaging from everywhere, wasn't it? And it was, it was bad timing because what had happened is we'd also kind of left the, from, from the start of COVID, obviously, we started to see things going up in price just because of availability of products. And there was companies taking advantage of that, whatever that was the case. Now, it was hard. You, you can't justify increasing prices when you've been given the VAT. How do you mean? Say that again? Well, <clears throat> they, they gave the VAT back then. We paid oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Than- yeah, yeah, sorry. The VAT dropped. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. When, when, you're being, when you've been given that, you can't really justify putting the prices up. So that kept the lid on inflation, keeping it down. That kept the lid on inflation at the time. But what happened when they put VAT back, rather than holding it back, they put VAT back full whack, although it went up slowly. Yeah. But then that created superinflation. Okay. Because you've not only – it's kind of like a triple whammy because you, you, you have to put the price up because generally things everything's gone up. You have to find the difference – in cost plus VAT, you know, so, and obviously if the cost of living has gone up, there needs to be an increase in your income as well. Yeah. Naturally. So where you'd usually, I don't know, people would usually put 20 pence here, 20 pence there. We're starting to see things going up a pound or one pound 50. And you're like, wow. But that was the reality of it. Now, what do you do? Do you, do you swallow it and then can't really afford to operate? You have a massive tax bill. You have, you know, because it was okay them giving us the VAT. It just created tax bill, mm. which needed to be paid at the end. Yeah. You know, if you hadn't got that money, how are you going to pay the tax? Yeah. What about to those that say that VAT is never yours? You should never consider it. It just yeah, you should always. You should always. Uh, we always look at prices plus VAT. Yeah. Um, 
but obviously there's also other businesses that have created a business model on VAT. So, how do you mean? <laughs> 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 Oh, I, 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 I just who, want... who needs friends like you still? What? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I'll take that back. I'll you know exactly. You ice cream. Cream. Yeah. I'm going to buy you yeah. an, ex- an ice cream next time. I, see, I should have plied yeah, you with in. lots. Of, I should have plied you with lots of ice cream before we did this, because then you would have been all giddy. You would have just said everything. But um, mm. but no, like so. Moving on. So I was chatting to a guy earlier. Did a podcast with a guy earlier, and they've got multiple units, sixty stores across your neck of the woods. And he was talking about like their gas went up like like a hundred and twelve percent or something like mental figures, and they yeah. depend on a lot of gas. Um, but he said one thing they never did was um, they never told customers with a um, an advert or or on or on social media that prices went up. They just trained the staff to deal with it in the store. How did yeah. you go about it back then? Again, exactly the same. Yeah, you know, do you? You don't see. We keep going to McDonald's as a as an example, but other than what they put the cheeseburgers up, they didn't. You know, they never kind of come out and saying, "Oh, we put prices up." They put prices up twice since then, but it's never been in the media, has it? No, not that I've seen, and definitely you not know, from McDonald's. Maybe they, gave, maybe they gave a little bit of information, kind of killing me softly information, where they put cheeseburgers up ten p and then stuck everything up, you know, yeah. by a larger amount. I think what well, people don't realize now, you know. Um, but ultimately, whether people realise or whether they don't, something costs that much. It costs that much, and that's we're not saying whatever, for- that's whatever industry you're in. You yeah, know, no, exactly. Look at, I'm looking at things that we're buying on a daily basis that have doubled and tripled in price, and you know we're putting uh, things are going up ten percent, and people are like, wow. But ultimately, fish and chips is still the cheapest takeaway. Mm. I think it's still definitely one of the best value products out there. As in, Absolutely. Uh, like, obviously, you can't compare a Greg's pasty to fish and chips. No, you, you just can't. can't. Compare, it's impossible. Like, you, know, you know, we we discussed this yesterday with McDonald's. You can't compare McDonald's meal to fish and chips because most of us need at least one and a half, if not two meals, <laughs> yet for, to feel. <laughs> I'm just looking at you. I'm saying nothing. Yeah. You're going to tell me <laughs> off again. Like. <laughs> a little bit full, you know. Um, you know, I, I can't think of anything pound for pound, kilo for kilo, um, that is as good value as fish and chips. No. I think probably like a bucket of KFC would get close, like a family deal or something. But I haven't been oh, for ages. I don't know not how. Cheap it. anymore, is it? No, nah, but but again. And we, we stopped going because of the quality of it. That's, I mean, I years, think... years and years ago, we used to love KFC. We, oh. we always used to say, wow, best takeaway. But over the years, slowly, slowly, it's been dragged down. The standards oh. of it, maybe the costing of the product and the pieces have got smaller. I think the three or four that we've been to haven't changed the oils in God knows how. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, that's the reason why I, I don't go KFC anymore because it's just become hit and miss, like mostly miss. Like it just, it, I don't know. I just can't remember the last time I ate. I think KFC though is a really good example of how sometimes they try and, you know, reduce the size, reduce the quality rather than adjusting the price accordingly. You know, uh, to be fair, the last time I don't, I can't remember the last time I seen more than two people in a KFC. Staff, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, even staff, yeah. Um, uh, but I mean, years ago, they were around back to maybe twenty, thirty years ago. There were people were out the door. I and I remember when we were growing up, it was one thing because we didn't sell some of the fried chicken as kids. Um, mm-hmm. But I remember growing up, like. And when dad brought KFC, it was like a tree. Like I felt like yeah. it was good. Like, you know, the coleslaw was good. You put extra black pepper on it as well. Like it was. Oh, here we go with pepper again. Sorry. <laughs> I forgot <laughs> how much you hate pepper and <laughs> brown. No, I forgot how much you like pepper. It's not, yeah. I don't dislike pepper. I love pepper. But Just for everyone's benefit here. Like you <laughs> dislike pepper massively. Like I, on the other hand, absolutely love anything. No, no. I like pepper. <laughs> <laughs> just not as much as you. <laughs> and, then, and then one of the other things I've realised about you is that you absolutely dislike brown, anything brown. Like, so remember when we were doing? Yeah, you look shocked, but remember when we were doing our website feedback just before we launched? Oh yeah, yeah. And you were one of the ten people that trialled it behind the scenes. Yeah, I remember every question. 
And I don't even think it was intentional, but every answer to those questions said, what's with all the brown? It's brown everywhere. It's brown. I was like... It was intentional. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing is ever by accident with me. It it was noted. Yeah. (laughs) Now we've hardly got any brown on the website. I think maybe at the bottom somewhere where it's hidden out of your view. Um, (laughs) But no, I, I do think KFC is one of those, like, did you see recently they changed their fries? And actually, I don't, yeah, them worse. <laughs> if, you, well, if you try them, they're still technically crap, but they taste better, but they're crap. Yeah. Really? No, no. <laughs> like, the texture's still terrible, like, mm. but they've got a bit of flavor now. Whereas before. I just don't understand how they can get it so wrong. I, like I'm that, convinced yeah. it's on purpose. I can't, I, I, I look, not being funny. You can go to Booker's and you'd have six or seven different frozen fries to choose from. That's mm-hmm. just Booker's. If you're a big group, you could ring up McCain's or Latosa and Lamb and Weston and say, look, I'm working on this group, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to use X amount of ton a year. I would need some amazing fries. Bring them down. Why can't KFC? It's got to be by design. I can't think of anything else. I, I just can't. I just can't. I don't know. And I think it's such a shame because, again, it was a great concept. The food... You know, you're actually eating food with some kind of substance. It's not all totally processed. You can have some chicken, you know. Um, some. <laughs> well, obviously, if you want to start going, you know, no, chicken no. burgers, chicken nuggets, and things of that highly processed, then ultimately mm. you're going to have to have... But if you're trying to stay away from processed foods, highly processed foods, should I say, you know, what are your real options out there? Mm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I just think, I just think for me, like... I don't know. I just can't get my head around KFC. Whereas the key thing about McDonald's, even from the early days, if you read the book from the early days, why Ray Kroc absolutely loved McDonald's is not just because of the burgers they did, but it's because he said they did great fries with their burgers. And I do actually quite like their fries. I think they're decent. I, I, well, obviously, I'm sure if he came oh, no. back now in the fries that we're doing now, he'd kind of say, what's this? You know, but... Yeah. Um, Fries at the time for him, it was something that, you know, back in them days, fries weren't everywhere. Mm. You know, fries were a novelty thing. It's not yeah. if you probably wanted fries, you had to go to Red Croc store to find fries. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. Else, yeah they were, they're, you're right. They were novel. It was a totally different times. It's not like today where everyone's doing fries, everyone's doing chips. And You know, the, yeah. I've, I've had people walk in a chip shop and say, why don't you do fries? I'm thinking, well, it's a chip shop. Yeah. Just smile and say, do chips, mate. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things... Like, so how did customers react to prices going up? You didn't tell them. They obviously noticed it. Were they all right? Did volume take a hit? Or no, we didn't. Obviously, we didn't hide it. Because no, no, I know you didn't hide it, clearly, but you didn't advertise, advertise it. clearly yeah. on the menus. Um... No, no, what, what, I'm, what I mean by that is not that you hid it. You didn't hide it. You did display it correctly, but you didn't yeah. advertise it on social media and say, we've increased our prices, is what I'm saying. Well, no, I, I think everyone can clearly see that you know, the price rise and everything, even when you go and do your own, you know, your own shop for the house or the supermarket, um, any logical person can sit and see how much things have gone up. Now, you know, I'll have a conversation with anybody, whether it's for me or against me or whether it pays me or it doesn't. But if we're going to have a conversation, it has to be an educated conversation on something that actually stands. Not you're just going to moan about the price because, it's gone up. You know, if you're coming and saying to me, you know, if you ask me why the why the price gone up, I'll justify why the price has gone up. I haven't just put the price up because just look at the petrol station for argument's sake. Because yeah, yeah I look every uh, every time uh, somewhere puts prices up, they're always going to lose a few customers. There's always going to be a few that will go. I like to think, and from my experience over the years, is a lot of the time, them few customers that don't like it and we'll go and try somewhere else. 90% of them come back. Yeah. You know, if if you just concentrate on what you're doing, forget what everybody else is doing and concentrate properly on what you're doing, offering a good product at a fair price. And a fair price means fair for the customer and fair for you so that you can keep providing that product and that level of service. You know, it's easy to make financial cutbacks, but then how do you justify it to the customer? I've always been able to come here and get served within 20 minutes. You know, why is it taking 45 minutes to get served now? Yeah. That makes sense. You know, I've always, I've always come here and never had a problem with the food. All of a sudden you're using a, a cheap potato or a cheap fish or 
why is it like that now? Well, what do you say? Yeah. You're going to turn around and say to that customer, I didn't want to put prices up, so... Yeah. So I gave you an inferior quality product. I knew of one shop at the time, and this was the choice they had to make, and they made it. Um, and they um, they dropped their fish size by about 20% and increased the price by like 25%. And I feel like their customers just massively rebelled because it's what you're just saying. They were, they were coming in and not getting the thing they were used to, yeah. and it was smaller, and it was more expensive. I've always found from my previous experience that – Customers would prefer to pay more rather than have less. Uh, have a, uh, less. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, we, I mean, in our industry, we have enough options on the menu for all customers. I mean, some stores you go in, you see they do a, a baby fish, cod, uh, fish goujons, a small fish, a medium fish, and a large fish. And you're thinking, wow, how do you even differentiate between all that in your cabinet? Yeah. Well, the options are there for people. You know, even in my store where we offer – three different sizes of fish. You've got your, your cod goujons, your small fish or your regular fish and your large fish. There's enough options there for people to make their own decisions on whether they need to drop down a size or yeah, or not, you know, or whether they want a larger one or for, for a logical person that's looking how to feed the family, there is plenty of options. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes complete sense. One of the things I wanted to ask you is – why did you never enter any of the Fish and Ship Awards? You've got a good shop. You've got very good practices. Um, some of the best practices I've seen, the way you run that business is very methodical. Um, you, you do a lot of training. When I'm there, like, just having a cup of tea, where you seem to be very focused. You have a good yeah. shop. Like, what's what's made you never enter? Um, it's just not for me still. You know, I think <sighs> everywhere you seem to go, a chip shop's got an award. You know, how many shops do you walk past and say award winning fish and chips or, and I think over the years that's kind of brought the credibility of it all down, you know, because when customers go in to an award winning fish and chip shop and have the worst fish and chips they've had in their life, which has happened a lot over the years that reflects on all of us. Yeah. Um, I haven't felt the necessity for it, really. Okay. Uh, um, I know I've spoke to I've spoke to a lot more experienced people than me in the industry, and they've kind of said, "Oh, it was um, if it wasn't for that, they don't think that their business would have gone as far as what they did." But okay, <clears throat> there's also a lot of shops that have kind of had that big influx of custom because they won the awards, and then it's just disappeared. So, what was it all for? Mm. Yeah, I guess. I you know, if, if I want if I want an award to advertise in my window, I can buy one for a couple hundred quid. It's not. Yeah, but I, I really do think that the best award is the return of your customers, mm. or more, and then when they bring more, yeah, more exactly. Obviously, you know, if you can keep growing your business, keep pushing it forward slowly. You know, sometimes people's expectations as well are a bit unreasonable. You know, you, uh, after. Uh, after the initial growth of any business, you're not going to see that growth no. constantly, you know, but you would expect every year to push a little bit forward. Yeah. You yeah. know, and sometimes people get disheartened by that. Yeah. Well, hopefully you want to grow above inflation every year, don't you really? Ideally. Well, you'd have to, otherwise you're yeah. going to go backwards. But yeah. Um, like I say, I've seen a lot of the times over the years, friends and family, or they've took, taken over a shop, they've doubled the takings within, you know, six months or something like that. And then all of a sudden it plateaus a little bit and they start saying, oh, but they lose, they lose something. Yeah. I don't know whether it's the, the love for it, their passion, that little bit of chemistry, or whatever it is, they seem to lose something. And then that's when you start to see the shops go back a little bit. Yeah. Um, it's weird. Yeah. It, it's weird. I think sometimes people do get burnout. I get it. You know, you, I don't, yeah, you, when you're there every day. I remember when I was working my dad's shop, I, I, I felt it wasn't so much burnout, but it was monotony, like doing the same thing every day. Like, um, Well, uh, you know, another big thing that we had that, that was instilled in McDonald's, but which is easy to do when you've got a lot of stores. Obviously, it's not so easy when you're a single unit store, but um, managers were always moved around from store to store. Yeah. You know, to see things with fresh eyes and – we always used to call it store blindness, where if a manager, a store manager had stayed in a store for too long, you'd start to walk into the store and things would start to look a bit ropey, a bit tatty. Yeah. Things wouldn't change. Problems start to 
the problems start to, you know, really get in, get into the store. Whereas when you change stores, like if I was to come to your store, I would see things that you don't see. If you come to my store, you will see things that I don't see. And that's no bad reflection on anybody. It's just naturally that your eye becomes blind to certain things when you see it every single day. Yeah, you just become accustomed to it. You become accustomed to it. You don't see them ceiling tiles that are going a little bit yellow, whereas when you've just walked straight into the store, you're like, God, mate, you know, you could do with changing them or wiping them down. or yeah. Because it's, it's something that's changed gradually over time. Um, and I think this is what's happened in a lot of the industries. Things start to become stale when you're stuck in one store. Um, and that's why you see so much sometimes people take over a store and all of a sudden it goes through the roof. The trick is whether they can maintain it. Yeah. No, interesting. We mentioned we touched on VAT earlier a little bit. Um, do you think the, the NFFF are good to try and promote? Well, not promote to talk to government to try get the VAT rate down. Do you think there's some legs there, or do you think they're barking up the wrong tree and there should be a different method? Well, talking's good in any uh, as long as everybody's kind of got the same goal. Um, it's whether they've got the resources to keep pushing forward with it and doing it and whether they'll actually get anywhere long term. But I, I think this is something that the whole country should kind of be up in arms about, really, not just the NFFF, you know. Um, we've had it's a, it's a stealth tax that people haven't seen since COVID. And the government keep going on about the amount of money that was outlaid. But everything's doubled in price since COVID. Pretty much everything. Now, that means VAT collections doubled mm, i think double might be a gross exaggeration i get your point though i think there are a lot of things if you look at you have doubled. Okay. yeah a lot of things have doubled in price and you know that's <laughs> you know you start <laughs> when you look at the increase they've had in revenue from vat there were from my eyes i you know people should be calling it for it to be reduced mm. because you're taxed on your income yeah you're taxed on your savings you tax when you spend it. How much of your actual income stays in your I pocket? I think the principle, forget VAT on fish and chips, I think the principle of VAT mm-hmm. makes sense to me. As in, yeah, in I agree. It's I a, agree. Yeah, it has it, to be. It's a tax on spending, which means it's not a tax on wages, which is good. If you save and you have a good year when you don't need to buy anything, then you're not getting yeah, extra tax. You just pay tax on the interest that you yeah. have. Yeah. And whereas, and I mean this from even, no, I mean this from a consumer point of view, because it is a consumer tax. So, um, if I choose not to buy a TV and a computer this year, then I'm not going to pay extra VAT. Um, whereas I think, uh, yeah, I do think at 20%, it is probably egregious. It's a bit annoying um, for the consumer before we even get into businesses, collecting it and passing it on. Um, I think that if it, I've been saying for a long time that if it was spread over more products, it could be lower. So for example, all the Greg's items, all the out of out of home items. So, for example, you know, VAT means value added tax. So that means value yeah. added. Would, being- when, you, when you've made when you've made a when you've made a, a pasty out of puff pastry that's got steak in it, you've added value there, whether yeah. it's hot or hundred percent. Yeah, regardless. Well, I, I, I think I'd go one step further. A sandwich. You mentioned earlier that a co-op, the aisle is a whole sandwich aisle now. Well, mm-hmm. how much? If I gave you four pound fifty. And we'll make it nine pounds so we can both have a sandwich. How big would the sandwich be for nine pounds? Like, I not it's two slices of bread and whatever they decide to put in it. Not yeah. even you'd be able to get your mouth around a, a four pound mm. fifty sandwich. And I've seen you go, you, go. Like, you know, you'll have a go. I know you'll have a go. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, for me, all out of home food should attract VAT. All I don't know mm. where you'd cut it off, but if you're buying a sandwich, yeah, there's value in convenience. Let's face exactly. it, exactly. That's a value in itself, isn't it? So I almost feel like you know, anything that's being delivered by aggregator should have VAT. So if you're getting an, a sausage roll and a cold drink, then that should have VAT on it at the proper rate, it, you know. And I think that for me, anything out of home needs to attract VAT. And then that answers their question of what do we do with, with the money that we're not getting anymore? Well, actually, you'll probably end up getting more money because it's on more products. Um, yeah. And I think a group of people need to present this idea to government because that's the they're never going to want to lose money. Government's never going to want to do it. So, well, uh, unless uh, obviously unless people like unite and are all adamant, then nothing's ever really going to happen. But um, 
I, I just don't think that customers understand how much of what they spend is actually VAT. But I think like, that's by design. I think that's you know, design. we're we're kind of. I will always have a conversation with customers, and I always say to them, you know, do you realise how much of that, you know, ten or twenty pound you've just spent is VAT? And they kind of look at, and then when you break down and tell them, they're like, really? I said, well, yeah, it says it on your receipt. Don't you look at your receipt? Yeah. And they're sh- they're shocked. Yeah, you know this. Um, I know we're probably going off the subject a little bit, but I've always kind of had a bee in my bonnet. Uh, uh, kids at school, you know, they seem to be taught everything except for things that need to be learned. You know, there's, life no, home, life there's no life skills. You know, <clears throat> they walk out they walk out of school at 16 or 18, whatever age they walk out of school at. They don't understand about interest rates. They don't understand about getting a loan, about running a bank account. They don't understand, you know, basics in life that they're going to have to deal with, but they're taught algebra that they'll never use again. <laughs> True, no. you know, and uh, I think if people understood more, or maybe it's by design. Again, we go back to this. Maybe it's by design that they're not taught these things. Could be they, they, they don't raise the issues when they go. But if people actually understood how much of their wage actually goes on VAT, mm. I think they would be pretty horrified. Yeah, no, you're probably right. Yeah, you could be right, but I guess it's our job as parents to teach our kids this thing, these things, and you know. Yeah. But it would be better if they did a bit at school. But yeah, it help us a little bit. But it needs to be done at school because, like we say, there's a generation of parents that don't understand it. So how are they going to teach it? To yeah. Them? When I went to school and I left in 2000, I don't know when you left, but I left in in 2000. But you know, there were um, home economics classes. There were these things where people were learning how to sew and stitch, mm. and you know, I didn't partake too much of that but i did food courses i did food technology um so obviously food was my big draw so i Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that um so but yeah i think i think life is changing but it would be good if they understood more um but yeah what do you see we're going to start closing up now what do you see is the biggest risks to fish and chips ah the risks are everywhere still to be honest it's um from I see, you know, we've, we, there's different factors. There's different factors. There's different. There's different business and business models. You know, there's multi. There's people with chains. There's people with single units. Uh, there's people, obviously, that we're seeing a lot more of now. Is they're going into high end restaurants, fish and chips, um, and they all kind of incur different um, different risks. I think. Um, you know, as far as single single unit stores, I think the biggest risk to them is is vegetating, getting stuck in their old ways and not changing and not pushing forward and um, being scared to put the prices up to offer a quality product. It's no good putting the prices up and serving the same rubbish because you're setting yourself up for disaster. Well, I guess but, there's a bit of you know, a, if you, a bit. There's got to be a bit of a learning curve there as well, because if you want to serve a better product, then you've got to do some tests and learn to serve a better product, get on top of, let's say, oil management. And, you know, Still, I, I think a lot of people in the industry, you know, especially the ones who know these things, I don't think there's, I don't think that they're necessarily uneducated on all these things. I think, yeah, I think a lot of it falls down to monotony. And I don't want to say it in a, in a bad or a nasty way because we're all probably a little bit of a victim of it. It's a bit of laziness. Um, you know, you, you've you've done too many hours this week. You've done too much already. And it's like, does that oil really need changing? Yeah, it does. You know, oh, but we know, you know, we need to train some staff because, you know, we've got 20 staff and four are going this summer because uh, they're going off to uni. But we're still going to need 20 staff, maybe a few more. Well, obviously, you have to start thinking about it now, you know. Is there some kind of recruitment in place? Have you got any training policy in place? Have you got something to support what the shop needs? Um, and I think a lot of the single units are just slowly, slowly vegetating because the costs, the costs of running the store have become a lot, have gone up a lot. Yeah. There's a lot more red tape now. Yeah. There's a lot more red tape, you know, and people have to understand, uh, you know, more than five employees, then you have to have other things in place as well. You know, you have to have your risk assessments and uh, mm. the thing, everything with insurance where you need your fire <clears throat> or your fire documents in place. And, um, obviously it just adds to the workload. And if you're not, a, a, if you're not a chain or you can't afford to employ a department mm. to do these things, you know, obviously running a, a chain of stores, you, you've got your own, 
QA department, you've got your own health and safety department, you've got your own um, accounting department, which you just kind of work together and communicate and, and keep pushing forward. It's easier to make that grow. But when you can't afford to have that, it becomes hard work over time. Yeah. Well, um, and what comes first? It's the chicken and egg situation. Isn't well, it? Yeah. yeah. What comes first? What comes last? And how much can you really do? But if we keep with this mentality that we have to do everything, slowly, slowly, we're just going to go backwards. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And I wanted to sort of touch on something like, what do you think, what business out there, like food business, do you really like at the moment? Who do you think is really smashing it? Um, is there anyone that you can think of that's doing a good job? Um, I'd like to think that fish and chips are doing well. I think the good stores from what I'm hearing are doing well. I think from what I hear in the ones that are suffering again, are the ones that are vegetating slightly, not prepared to change. They're tired long in there, or they haven't got the funds there to, you know, to refit or to push forward again, you know, give another, another burst of energy into the business which I can understand because obviously the, the retail value of shops now selling, you're thinking if you're getting to the stage where you're looking in the horizon, you're retiring, of, you know, five, six, seven years, is it financially feasible for you to go and pump 100, 150,000 into the business to refit it? Yeah. Uh, uh, if you're looking at the resale value and, you know, some of the shops aren't even getting that. So what? I remember I used to meet up with my business manager from Nat West quite often before he changed and then the other guy changed and then the other guy changed and then the other guy changed. But he was a good guy, this one. Aaron, his name was. And I remember he went to see a fish and chip shop. He never told me which one because obviously that would be breaking a confidence. But we mm -hmm. met up for a coffee and we were chatting. He just wanted to know what was going on with Ceres. And, and he says, oh, he goes, uh, he goes, I just met someone who wanted a loan. And I said, mm -hmm. all right. He goes, he's had a chip shop. He goes, but... He goes, after asking him, like, how confident are you about the future of the business? How excited are you? Trying to get really some positive answers to take back to, yeah. to put into his system. The guy says to him, I'm depressed. I don't want to be here no more. I'm sick yeah. of my life. And obviously the, the loan got declined. How many times have you seen this still when you're going into people's shops? Mm. Into, I would say um, single store operators in general. Mm. Um, we're starting to see it a lot and you know yeah I get it you know you've been doing it for 20 years and you know it's not your goal in life anymore maybe the money isn't in it like it once was or for whatever reason why is but the money there for those that are doing well though like in that respect what have they done differently do you think it goes back to the aspect that customers are prepared to pay for a quality product and quality service yeah so because prices have gone up now so let's say I'm just trying to, I'm doing a very rough calculation. Your fish and chips roughly cost two pound 50 more than they did before COVID. I'm, I'm taking a rough guess here. Yeah. 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 Okay. With that comes higher expectations. Customers now say, yeah. you know what? I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to eat it, but I'm going to go somewhere where it's good. Yeah. How many times have you gone and had a meal, you know, spent 15, 20 quid on a meal, let it and thought, now that was an anticlimax and just chucked it in the bin <laughs> and you thought, forget it. Only you'd use no. the word anticlimax though, because <laughs> well, obviously, you, good food you're supposed to get excited about. If you can't get excited about it, you need to change profession. No, I know. <laughs> no, I know. Just only you would say the word anticlimax over that. But I know yeah. I get your point. Cause I've been out with you many times and yeah. I've had something to eat and you just sort of like, you know, you get a bit annoyed with it. Yeah. Look, I, I'm very much the kind of person if, if the your food's good, I will pay you what you ask for it. Yeah. But if it's not good, I don't want to give you a penny for it. Yeah. Because especially if I go into a restaurant still, because, you know, when you go into a, a restaurant, you know, you're giving them time, mm -hmm. you're giving them money, and it's all trained staff. There's no excuses. There's no excuses when I'm giving you 45 minutes to put food on my plate and I'm paying you 30, 35 pounds for a meal to put slop on my plate. Yeah. There's no excuse for that. You know, sometimes when you go into a takeaway, you're a little bit forgiving because you're thinking, hold on, I'm walking into a takeaway. I spec'd it for less than a tenner, served to me within four or five minutes. And I don't want to pay top dollar. You know, I don't want silver service. I don't want somebody saying, you, you know, coming to my table and offering. I just want to get my food and go eat the meal and be happy with it. Obviously, it's hard to get the balance sometimes, especially if it's a quiet store between having food fresh and hitting a service time as well. Yeah. 
it's it's a bit of a catch twenty two. So yeah. No, yeah, I am more forgiving with takeaways than maybe I'm with the restaurants, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think you're sort of right. I think so, but it feels like there is a pattern emerging, though, that you fear that actually the, the, the same thing that is the negative could also, if you spin it around, could also be the positive. So if, well, exactly. Yeah. It goes back to the stage where you say when you ask me about, you know, challenges or problems, I don't see them as challenges or problems. I see them as opportunities. Yeah. So if you're taking on a business with these problems, that's an opportunity. Yeah. No, you know, it, it, and don't get me wrong. I'm my own biggest critic, mm. you know, just like you hear me when we go out to restaurants. I know a lot of the boys don't like going out to eat with me for this reason, but the way I am with other people, I also look at myself. I'm not saying I get everything right because trust me, I don't. Um, but you know, well, my, my, my one moral is I'd never, serve anybody food that i wouldn't eat myself yeah but i hear that a lot i'm not gonna lie mate i hear that a lot and i know you so i know you mean it but i hear that a lot and yet you know i've seen shops that say that but don't mean that like and you know i I went to a shop in london one the guy sold up now and he had cod on the menu and i walk out the back and he was defrosting hokey in the sink in water. No, yeah, that's just in a space, yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. And I think, but you know, he said these things, and I think it's become a cliche, like, you know, and I think that's why I, I, I like doing away with cliches, and I'm just a bit like, you know, let's graft and let's turn it around, and we can turn this into something to be proud of, like, yeah. you know. And and I just, if you can't be whatever industry and you're in, if you can't be proud of what you do, mm. wrap it up and go and do something else. Well, again, you, know, you said earlier that anyone over here in the UK that is can walk into any job. Yeah, like, well, so yeah, if you're self and probably earn as much money, it's not like you know the wages yeah. are there now. There's no excuses. Yeah, so if you're working in, a, in whatever field of work and you're really unhappy and you're depressed and you've got VAT to worry about and tax to worry about and PAYE to worry about, then why punish yourself? Just yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this is what we're seeing. I think eventually, you know, maybe over the next generation or so, we'll see a lot of these shops. They're just not worth running anymore Yeah, financially. And I think they will disappear. We've been saying this for a long time, a lot of us in the industry, but I think it is kind of looking at the cost of running stores. It, it will get to that stage where, you know, unless you can take an X amount of money, it's just not worth it. Yeah. Um, but again, it's a catch-22. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Have we missed anything? Have we, I think we discussed quite a bit. Have we missed anything? I can't think of anything. I'm sure you'll remind remember something when we're talking later on. No, it's fine. But no, I just want to say thanks for your time. And um, we talk all the time, but I wanted to get your views out there and you know impress the flesh a little bit and you know let others listen to what others have to say. So really grateful for your time because I know you you're busy and you've got a lot to do. Yeah, thank you very much, Stone. All right, mate. Talk soon. Take care.